All right, Ecclesiastes for Beginners. This is lesson number eight. Uh, title of this lesson, Worship Attitude. And we are in Ecclesiastes chapter five. All right, so far Solomon has been uh, giving us uh, some pretty bleak results of a life dedicated to finding meaning and satisfaction without God. He's not a happy person. He's not a happy camper. The conclusions themselves are rather uh, depressing. In chapter five, uh, there is an abrupt change as he makes some comments about worshiping God properly. And then he goes on to talk about the enemy of spirituality, which is materialism. Uh, he's going to conclude in chapter six with a self portrait of his own life and some advice that he gives based on his experiences so far. So as I said, it, it's not a happy conclusion, obviously, uh, that he comes to as uh, he gives uh, some, uh, you know, some uh, conclusions about uh, what, his like, uh, what his life has been like as an individual who has pursued all avenues of experiences in order to find happiness and contentment apart from a relationship with God. So without any warning, you know, streaming these type of ideas, then all of a sudden, without any warning, Solomon leaves off his description of his lifestyle and he begins to warn his readers about the proper attitude that they should have when worshiping God. And he just kind of goes through these, we'll read these uh, as they begin in chapter five. First of all, he says, when you're worshiping God, pay attention. So chapter five, verse one, guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. So pay attention, realize that you are going to worship Almighty God, the creator and the judge of the world. Uh, to not be prepared, to not be attentive, to be distracted, this is disrespectful and, and he says it's dangerous. You know, God speaks to us through the sermon in our, in our own experience today. God speaks to us through the sermon, through the prayers, the songs, the Bible studies that we have. So we should be aware, listening for Him to speak to us in one way or another. And that cannot happen if we are not paying attention, if we're allowing ourselves to be distracted. It's one of the reasons why we say, hey, you know, you should turn off your phone, you know, for, a, for what? For an hour, for a one hour Bible study and another hour of worship, surely we can get by without our, our phones for, uh, for, that amount of, for that amount of time. That's the distractions of our generation, but people have always been distracted. Uh, when uh, worshiping God. And, and we know this because Solomon is warning about that. Even in his time and in his generation, this seemed to be a problem. Second thing he says, worship attitude, guard your mind. Verses two and three, he says, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few for the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. And then he makes another comment about this in verse seven. He says, for in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. Rather, he says, fear God. So when you pray, don't be too quick to blame God for things because he's really listening. You're not just talking to, to air. God is really paying attention when you are addressing him in prayer. Give as much respect in your prayers as you would if you had a, an interview with a prospective employer or if you were speaking to a high government official, the governor or the president. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you be paying attention? Would you be checking your phone messages you know, if the president of the United States or if the governor were, you, know, you were in a meeting with that person? Of course not. So he's saying, you know, pay, pay attention, guard your mind and let your yes be yes and no be no with God. He's not impressed with repeated words or the number of prayers that you make. We've learned uh, not only in this study, but in other studies, uh, especially the New Testament, that it's honesty and devotion and faith that God wants in prayer, not eloquence, not volume, 
Uh, nothing wrong with eloquence. Some are gifted with the ability to be eloquent. And so they should use that gift in their praise of God through prayer and song and uh, if they're creative through you know, written materials. But this isn't necessarily the thing that God is looking for. He's looking for honesty and sincerity in prayer. Also, when you are in worship, fear God. Don't drift or daydream. Stay focused, he says. It's easy to let the mind wander uh, and become distracted and make rash promises or make uh, rash statements in prayer. I know people, you know, sometimes uh, they're angry or upset because a prayer has not been answered or uh, maybe the prayer has been answered but not in the way that uh, the individual was uh, seeking uh, for an answer. And I've heard and seen people become angry at God and make rash statements. And Solomon is warning, you know, be careful. Be careful what you say and what you think when addressing God. So Solomon says that when you worship, you should be calm, focused on God, simple and honest in your prayers and in your, in your speaking with Him. Another thing he says in verse five, keep your promises. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for He takes no delight in fools. Pay what you owe and pay what you vow, rather. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? So if you offer God your life, then don't take it back. If you promise to give up something, then don't start it again. If you, tell, uh, uh, if you tell him that you're going to do something, make sure that you do it. Uh, and why? Because God remembers. God remembers. Asking God's blessing on what you propose to do and then not do it, or repenting of a sin and then going back to it. These things lead to judgment because God remembers all of our prayers and promises and He holds us accountable. So on one side we have to be prudent in what we say and what we ask for because God remembers and so that, that moves us to, be, you know, to fear God. But I also take that as a great comfort. Because if God remembers all of my prayers, that means He even remembers the ones that I've made and made sincerely, but perhaps have forgotten. Things that I've asked Him many years ago and with time and you know, things happening, I've forgotten about that prayer. But God hasn't forgotten about it. God hasn't forgotten how He will answer and when, we, when He will answer. Isn't that happen to you sometimes? You know, all of a sudden something happens uh, I, I can't imagine what, but something happens and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is the answer to a prayer I made months ago or years ago. So we need to be careful when we do these things. Um, Solomon says that um, if you're not sure, you're better off not saying anything and not vowing anything. The idea of you know, with many words, you know, there's sinfulness. Jesus says that we shouldn't make vows. And the reason for this is because we're too weak to keep our vows, to keep them perfectly. Better that we answer simply yes or no than to make elaborate promises. For the Christian, in James chapter 4, verse 15, James says that our, commitment, our commitments to the Lord should be based on our dependence on Him to help us carry these things through. You know, when he says, if the Lord is willing, I'm willing to do this thing and I'm, I'm even wanting to do this thing. And if the Lord is willing, then these things, you know, these things will be done. These things will be accomplished. It's not just using if the Lord is willing as some sort of catchphrase. Like if you say, I'm going there tomorrow, Lord willing, that covers it. It's the attitude. It's the if the Lord is willing type of attitude, even if the words are not necessarily spoken, if the attitude is there, the prayerful, humble attitude that says, 
you know, my life is in the hands of God. To live and to die, they're in the hands of God. And so if tomorrow comes, then I have confidence that God will provide for me. That kind of attitude that he's talking about here. So, after his comments about worship, Solomon goes on to discuss what he has learned about the pursuit of wealth and power. So he kind of jumps from one thing to another. In verses 8 to 17, he gives five principles concerning the pursuit of wealth that he lists in a row. Some things that he has learned during his lifetime and during the time that he has spent pursuing wealth. First thing he says, absolute power corrupts. Let's read chapter five, verse eight and nine. He says, if you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight, for one official watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. In other words, you know, one official watching over another one higher and higher. You know, the rich are getting richer and more powerful one over the other, but the tendency is to neglect, not help the poor. That's, that's what he's seeing. The oppression of the poor, denial of justice he's talking about. And then he says, I've seen one official over another, over another, suggesting the idea that they're, they're just simply interested in their own positions, maintaining their own power at whatever level they are and not dealing with the injustice, may even be causing the injustice that is taking place among the poor. The way it should be is that a powerful leader should cultivate his people, as he's kind of making a, you know, a, an imagery there of the people being a, a field, you know, where the farmer cultivates his field. Was, he says a, a leader should cultivate his people meaning he should help them to grow and to develop and to have a good life. That's why God puts leaders there. You know, sometimes people have trouble with the idea that you know, all leadership is permitted by God. And they say, well, you know, what about the terrible leadership in this country or the dictator in that country? You mean God is permitting that? Yes, God is permitting that. We have to remember God is permitting that and God will judge that. Leaders will be judged on their leadership, what kind of leadership that they provided. It's the comfort that we as ordinary people can draw from what God teaches us in His word, that one day there will be justice and we shouldn't be discouraged about it. Anyways, uh, 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 Solomon is talking now about his own pursuit and what he's found is that the more power you have, the more corruption uh, that you're subject to. Okay, number two, he says, greater wealth does not equal greater satisfaction. Verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Now, if there's anyone who could have felt satisfaction from wealth, it was Solomon. He was the richest man in the world at the time, the wisest man in the world at the time. But he concludes that the getting of more and more money does not produce more and more satisfaction. Only the desire to have more money. You see how that works? <laughs> the more you have does not breed in you satisfaction. Having a lot of whatever does not create the satisfaction. He's saying having a lot only creates the desire to have more. So it, it, it works in a, contrary, in a contrary way. Greater wealth does not equal greater satisfaction. And, and then you know, later on, he's going to give some solutions for these problems. Right now, he's just saying, that, you know, in, my, in my pursuit of wealth and riches, these are the things that I have learned. Um, he says, more money equals more worries. Verse 11 and 12, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. So the more you have, the more you have to take care of. 
and the more you have to protect and count and service and replace. I remember uh, many years ago, a comedian who had a popular TV show became wealthy, Jerry Seinfeld, still obviously uh, performing today. But I remember reading about him. He was, uh, he's a fellow that collects uh, automobiles of all kinds, you know, a wealthy man's pursuit. And he lived in New York City, so you know, he couldn't just leave these uh, valuable automobiles on the street. So he you know, rented a garage, then he built the garage, and he expanded his garage, and, and then he had trouble from his neighbors and from the uh, apartment association. It was just one big headache, and all he wanted to do was have a garage to put his cars in. And the more cars he collected, the more headaches he collected uh, as well. The idea that Solomon is saying here, you lose sleep because of the fear of losing what you have or because of the work required to maintain what you have. On the, uh, on the outside uh, of life, uh, we see the life of wealthy people um, you know, they seem relaxed and carefree, but the truth is that on the inside, many wealthy people are plagued with frustration, anxiety, discontentment, loneliness, and they worry about losing their stuff. They have to hire people to count their stuff and to insure their stuff and to maintain their stuff. And they have to make sure that the people that they've hired are treating them honestly. You know, it's, it's, it's a burden to have many, to have many things. Number four, he says, you cannot take it with you. Verses 13 to 15. There is grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. You can't take it with you. Popular saying derived from this passage. No matter how hard you work, how much you hoard, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to keep it in this life and you'll definitely have to let it go when you die. Uh, Self-evident, isn't it? And yet people have trouble understanding this, this idea. Um, what is the fastest growing piece of construction going on? Everywhere you look, what are, they, what are they building even here in Oklahoma City? They're building more storage units, as if we didn't have enough storage units. People have three car garages and still don't have enough stuff, uh, enough space for their stuff. They have to rent other space to do what? To, to, you know, to keep the stuff that they don't have anything to do with that they don't use, but they, you know, they have to hang on to it. Number five, he says, live high, die hard. This is also a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and um, and anger. So if wealth is what you pursue, then your life, he says, will be filled with discontentment. You know, whether you fail or succeed. And your death will be, will be hard. Hard because money is no comfort to those who are dying. And that, I don't have, you don't have to be Solomon to know that. You know, I've learned that just in you know, the experience of my ministry visiting people who are ill and families who are dealing with the loss of a loved one, uh, you know, having a you know, relationship and having uh, conversations with people who are dying. You know, their, their death is imminent within days. And what I've noticed in my experience is that none of these people talk about their money. Uh, nobody talks about their bank account. Nobody takes comfort in the fact that you know, I've got enough saved to live another 20 years. How many times do you hear people, they scrimp and save and you know, they, they just uh, so obsessed about making sure they have enough for their retirement. And every day you read in the paper, there's always an article, what you need to have for retirement. You know, and they say, well, you need at least a million dollars. How discouraging is that for someone who just has an ordinary job to be told by the quote financial experts, oh, you have to have a million dollars saved up if you want a reasonable retirement. 
And some people deny themselves and scrimp and save and you know, it's like a joy, you know, no joy in their life because they're so focused on saving and you know, keeping the money. And then they retire and then two years later they, they die. Yeah, they, they had enough money to last 25 years after retirement, but they only lived two years. You know, that, that's what Solomon would, would be saying. That that's certainly vanity of vanity. And other people, they, they do save that million dollars, right? They have that million bucks in the bank and they have all kinds of securities around them. You know? And what happens to these people? They, they worry and obsess nevertheless. Why? Because if you depend on money, there's never enough of it. You never have enough. Have you, have you never received a, like a refund check that you weren't expecting? For some reason or other, the government has gone through your income tax for the last three years, decided that you paid way too much, and sent you a check for $3,950, just coming like, what's the first thing that happens once you get that money? Oh, if they would have sent me 5,000, I could have paid off my car, or I could have gotten the new boat, or we could have taken that vacation. It's never enough. And Solomon is saying that in so many different ways. Anyways, in the final verses, uh, verses 18 to 20, Solomon goes on to contrast three God-given gifts that we receive if we have the right attitude about wealth, which he has warned about in the previous verses. So if you have learned any lessons from Solomon, according to wealth that he has taught, realize that God is the one who gives true enjoyment. So let's read verse 18. He says, here's what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. In other words, the, the ability to enjoy what you have is a gift that God gives to those who have the right attitude about wealth. If you have the right attitude about wealth, God gives you the ability to enjoy what you have, no matter what it is that you have. Secondly, God gives fulfillment, enables you to have fulfillment in your work. Verse 19, furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. God gives you the gift that enables you to enjoy your work and take satisfaction from what you do. A right attitude, you know, the wrong attitude is the grass is greener syndrome. If I could do this, if I was over there, I'd have this. And if I had his job or her job, you know, if you don't have that type of attitude about your work and career, then God will enable you to find satisfaction in what you actually do, not just what you'd like to do or what you will do one day. You know, it is a, tr a tremendous gift to be able to enjoy what you have and what you do today. Even if you have goals, we all have goals, even if you have goals and dreams and hopes and you're working towards another objective, you know, as far as your career is concerned, Solomon is saying God is able to help you enjoy and appreciate what it is that you have today. Even if it isn't you know, your dream or your hope or your objective is not fully realized. Can you imagine if the only time that you find any satisfaction is when your dreams are fulfilled? There's a lot of time between you know, when you start and when you finish your, your goal. It's like going to college. I used to tell our children when they were in school, if you don't like studying the things that you are studying you know, in, in, in college, the courses that you're taking, if you're not enjoying them, you're not going to enjoy the career that comes from that training and education. You need to be able to enjoy the, the process. You need to be enjoying you know, learning about what you're going to do, whatever that is, to be a biochemist or a teacher, or a lawyer, whatever you are. You have to be enjoying the process because if you don't enjoy the process, you're not going to enjoy the result. And, and, and the point that Solomon is making is this is a gift from God. He enables you 
to do these things. Matter of fact, these are the type of things we ought to be asking God in our prayers. Lord, please help me to enjoy, help me to be content with, help me to appreciate, to be satisfied with, because that's a thing only He can give us, not material things. Thirdly, God is able to give us this sense of general contentment. Verse 20, for He will not often consider the years of His life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. You're not worrying about growing old. You're not worrying about dying. You know, when he says here, not often consider the years of his life, you're not always worrying about that. You're enjoying the here and the now. God is giving you that type of contentment. Satisfaction and inner peace will find those who focus on the Lord instead of focusing on what they don't have or getting more of what they do have. If you're focusing on just getting more or you know, getting what you want and getting more of what you want, you're never going to find that peace, that contentment that only God can give. So these blessings of enjoyment, fulfillment, contentment, these are the worthwhile things of life that money cannot buy, but are freely given by God. Okay. So in chapter six, Solomon takes a break from his thoughts on the pursuit of wealth and he becomes introspective and he gives us a portrait of himself as the king who pursued all of these things. Again, as I said, he kind of jumps from one thing to another. He's not writing a novel here. He's not writing a story where you know, all the characters have to match up. It's a diary, remember? And so a diary has different thoughts, different directions on different days. So in verses um, uh, one to nine, he says that he is actually depressed for several reasons. So let's read uh, the next section, chapter six, verses one to nine. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he, for it comes in futility and goes into obscurity and its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun and it never knows anything. It is better off than he. Even if the other man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good things, do not all go to one place? All a man's labor is for his mouth and yet the appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and striving after wind. Certainly not a very you know, uh, uplifting conclusion. First of all, he is not able to fully enjoy all that God has given him. That's how he starts. You know, he's gotten everything, wisdom and you know, riches and all the advantages, and yet he can't enjoy it. The foreigner that he mentions in these verses, this can be a, an enemy or a disease or a depressed spirit, but something's in his way. Some foreign thing is between him and the enjoyment of all that he's been given. We know that his lack of a full devotion to the Lord is what has blocked his enjoyment and his peace. You know, he has everything, but he can't enjoy it. Excuse me. He has lost to children and even replacing them with many other children cannot create the joy that he is missing. He talks about that in verses three to five. And long life or short life, he says these are both the same. They both end in death. This is something that he's mentioned over and over and over again from different perspectives throughout his observations, right? That you, you, you can't take it with you. The rich and the poor, they both die. The wise and the fool, they both die. One's not better than the other because of this. So that's an observation that he, he makes quite a few times. Also, we get the sense that he is weary of not being satisfied with what he has. 
and wearier still of continually wanting more. Better he should be content with what he has, but he isn't. But he isn't. He, he understands what it is that he needs. I need to be satisfied with all the things that God has given me, but I'm not. So in the final verses, he makes some realistic observations concerning his own life and his own condition. First of all, he says, God is sovereign. Chapter 6, verse 10a, whatever exists has already been named. Now, in that culture, at that time, naming something denoted sovereignty. In other words, if you give something a name, you, you are sovereign over that thing. So God is the one who named Adam and then Adam named the animals. And so here he says, everything has been named, meaning Solomon concedes that no matter how great he is, there's always someone greater than, than he is. You know, everything has been named. Someone has done greater things than he, and in this case, it's, it's God. So God is sovereign, all right? First thing he's learned. Secondly, man is not sovereign. Uh, and it is known what man is, right? It is known what man is. This suggests that man will never be sovereign, will always be in the position of inferiority before God and thus has no reason for pride. You know, so if, if all, everything's been named, it means you know, Solomon is not the one who named everything. The one who named everything, he is sovereign. Well, that's God. And then he says, you know, and it is known what man is. Well, who knows what man is? Well, God knows what man is. Man is down here and God is up here. And he recognizes and acknowledges that fact, despite all of his you know, tremendous experiences and wealth in life. And thirdly, disputing with God is a waste of time. He says, for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he is. For there are many words which increase futility. What then is the advantage to a man? You know, God's ways are not our ways. We, we, don't, we don't have to understand. A lot of times people are always praying and wondering, I wonder what God wants and why did God do that? And why is this happening to me? They're wanting to understand, but we don't have to understand. It's not written anywhere that we have to understand. Our job is to believe. Our job is to obey. His way is always the best for us in the end. We, we can trust that. Even though we may not understand the specifics of why what is happening to us is happening to us, for good or bad, a lot of people are stressed out because they've been so blessed and they're going, well, I don't deserve this. You know, what have I done to deserve this? Well, you don't, you don't have to understand. You know, God is not asking us to understand. He's asking us to believe and to obey. And He's assured us that He is love. God is love. So that whatever the plan is for us, whatever the meaning of what we're going through, we can rest assured that it is the God of love that is working these things out in our out in our lives. So Solomon finishes the last verse by saying that no one knows what life will bring, how it will end, what will come after. What's not said is that God does know and He does care and faith in Him is what He wants, not debate. Verse 12, he says, for who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life. He will spend them like a shadow, for who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? <clears throat> no use debating with God. You know, I've, Solomon, I've looked at it all, I've tried it all, I'm, I'm here to tell you I can't figure it all out. Who knows these things? Only God knows these things. So chapter six completes the first major part of this book. Uh, in these chapters, Solomon has examined life from every angle and he's experimented with every human desire in order to find satisfaction and happiness and true contentment, but to no avail. He had the right objectives to find contentment, to find satisfaction, to find happiness. You know, those, those are absolutely legitimate objectives in life, absolutely. It's just that he went about them the wrong way, and thus 
you know, failed. So he has discovered um, in his search only disillusionment. You know, it wasn't all that he thought it would be. You know, at the beginning it was like, wow, I've got a great life experiment here. I'm going to try all kinds of stuff you know, and see what life is about and to make myself happy. And his conclusion is I've tried all these things and wow, I'm, I'm disillusioned. And discontentment, that's the other thing that he's found. I have everything, he says, but I'm not satisfied. And the terrible thing is I keep wanting more, even though I know it's not going to satisfy me. And then of course, depression. Disillusionment, discontentment, depression. So disillusionment plus discontentment equals depression. This dead end forces him to begin looking in you know, another direction for peace and joy, the peace and joy that he desires. The thing that he's found out is the more that you, uh, the, the desire to acquire more does not create contentment. The desire to have more creates only a greater desire to have more. So if you have a lot, Having a lot of whatever doesn't naturally give a person satisfaction and contentment and joy. Having a lot, he says, simply breeds the desire to have more. There we go. Tried to kind of bring that into a more succinct statement. He's found that out. And so from uh, looking strictly in a horizontal direction, more of this, try that, try something different here on earth with earthly things. Now he's going to go to a horizontal direction, upwards towards God for his answers. And when we get to chapter seven, we're going to see him begin to look beyond the physical world to the spiritual world for answers and some of the things that he Desire. So, so far he's been looking at life and experience always under, under the sun, here on earth, without regards to God. As we move forward, we're going to see that turn and he's going to start looking beyond the sun, above the sun, where God is, if you wish, in order to find the same things, to find the answers to the same problems. And we're going to, uh, we're going to continue with that as we uh, march through the uh, uh, book of uh, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes with Solomon. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time.